Amen. Well, good morning, Frontline. It's good to be with you. Good to see you again. If you're watching with us online, great to have you uh, in the room with us as well. We've just already encountered the presence of Jesus this morning. And so everything else from here is just sort of like icing on the cake. Um, we're in a series right now called I Am. And, and what we're doing as we prepare our hearts for uh, Good Friday and Easter Sunday is we're looking at these seven I Am statements of Jesus that he makes in the Gospel of John. So seven different times in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am, and then he reveals something. He makes a claim about himself, about who he is. And these claims are so incredibly powerful, they can absolutely transform our lives when we take his claims and we take them into the center of our, of our lives. In fact, Jesus claims about himself, these I am statements are so potent, Jesus was actually not crucified for any crimes he committed. Jesus was crucified for the claims that he made about himself. That's what got him killed. And so what we're doing every week is we're looking at another one of these I am statements, and we're allowing that to challenge us and, and to take those into the core of our being. And so today, uh, we're just looking at one verse, literally John chapter 8, verse 12. The I am statement we're looking at today of Jesus is, I hardly ever preach an entire sermon on just one verse. That's what we're going to do today because that's all we need. We only need one verse today. Uh, so you ready to go? All right, awesome. So this is John 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There is so much packed into those two sentences, that one verse. I am the light of the world. That's what Jesus says. Whoever follows after me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, uh, what's interesting is we talk about light and darkness as metaphors in, in our world today, don't we? Like we talk about light as hope. We talk about despair, you know, or darkness, you know, as despair. Like I, I, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to a friend of mine who's been going through a really rough time. And I said, how are you doing? And he said, well, I, you know, it's been pretty dark, but I, I feel like there's a light at the end of the... Right. What a weird expression. <laughs> And as soon as he said it, I knew what he meant. You know exactly what he meant. He meant it's, it's hard right now. There's a lot of despair, but I, there's hope. I see a light at the end of the tunnel. Well, where do we get that? I mean, what, what tunnel? I mean, if you're standing on the train tracks and there's a light at the end of the tunnel, that's bad news, right? <laughs> and, but, but somehow we've associated, we, we understand, no, no, no. Light means hope. Darkness is despair. We also talk about light and hope, and we use metaphors, uh, like we think of light as being safe. We think of light as safety and comfort. We think of darkness as scary, the unknown, right? If you have kids, you know this. Uh, little, little kids, when you go to put them to bed at night, they say, oh, can you leave the light on? Don't turn the light off. My boys, our, our four boys, always when they were little, like, dad, please leave the light on. There's monsters in the dark in my room. And so always I would say, there are no mon there's no such thing as monsters in the dark in your room. Now get back in bed or I'm going to let the monsters into your room. <laughs> so they, they, it worked every time. They were terrified. It was awesome. Uh, we, even as adults, we're still kind of like scared of the dark, aren't we? You ever heard, of, you guys know what Motel 6's slogan is? Well, we'll leave the light on for you. Yeah, I heard somebody say it. Which is really, if you think about it, it's just another way of saying, you don't want to be at a Motel 6 in the dark. <laughs> Have you ever been at a Motel 6 in the dark? It is terrifying. Terrifying. Light is safe. Darkness is scary. Uh, also, we talk about light and we, we associate it with beauty. Like when, when a beautiful woman walks in the room, we say things like, oh, she just lit up the room. Right now, what do we mean? We don't mean she literally had light emanating from her. What we meant is she was beautiful. She's attractive. She drew our attention. She lit up the room. Well, for the Jewish people that Jesus was speaking this I am statement to, when he said, I am the light of the world, for the Jewish people, they had metaphors. They had ways of understanding light and darkness as well, especially as it related to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. If you go to the very beginning of the Bible, of our Bible, we call it, uh, you know, the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 1, the entire Bible begins with this story of God creating the heavens and the earth. The, the earth was formless and void. There was nothingness and God, guess what the very first thing is in all of creation that God creates? What is it? Light. Yeah. There, there was nothing and God spoke it into being. He said, let there be light. There was still nothingness, but at least now you could see it. And then because of that as well, 
uh, light was also the very first thing in all of creation that God called good. So for the Jewish people, light was something that God, only God could create. Only God could make light. And not only that, but Jesus waits, he waits and says this statement. In John chapter 7 and John chapter 8, Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. It was this week-long feast that happened every year on the Jewish calendar. People would flood into the, the city of Jerusalem, and they would celebrate the fact that God had rescued them, that he had led them as the light of Israel all through the, their time in the wilderness. As a pillar of fire at night, he was the light that led them. In fact, during the Feast of Tabernacles, when Jesus said this, what they would do is the Jewish people, they would light this huge candelabra. It was it's called a menorah. They would light this thing. And they would have these pillars of, of huge flaming fire, and, and they would talk about how God was the light for Israel. Do you see it? Do you see what Jesus did? He's, he's literally saying, hey, that light, actually, that's me. He's claiming to be God. Only God could produce light. Only God could make light. Only God was the light that led Israel. And Jesus is saying, that light only pointed to me. It's me. I'm the light of the world. Now, here's what we do. We misunderstand Jesus' statement. Oftentimes when we read this statement because of our own sort of baggage we bring to this, what we think Jesus is saying when he says, I'm the light of the world. If you follow after me, you'll never walk in darkness, but you'll have the light of life. We think Jesus is saying, hey, I'm the light of the world. Uh, if you have me, you're going to do fine. But, you know, if you, if you don't have me, watch out because you might fall into some darkness. We think Jesus is saying, if you don't have me, things might get dark for you at some point in your life. That's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is actually saying is the default position of every single human being is darkness, despair, hopelessness, nothingness. The default position of this entire world is darkness. You don't believe me? Just turn on the news. This world is dark. And Jesus is actually saying, I am the only real light there is that can come into your darkness. It's just me. So what I want to do here in the next few minutes is I want to talk about two ways that this offends us. And then I want to talk about two promises that Jesus gives us in this one verse, this one profound verse of the Bible. And then I want to talk about two ways that we can respond to this claim that Jesus makes. So two ways this offends us, two promises Jesus gives us, and two ways to respond. Okay, so first, two ways this offends us. Now, I, I didn't come here today to offend you, although I've found out I'm pretty good at it, actually. Uh, uh, but but the, the heart here is not to offend. That's not what I want to do. But I think if we don't really examine, if we don't see the offensiveness of this claim, not only just to the Jewish people of Jesus' time, but to us today, then we don't really fully understand what he was saying. We don't allow it to fully penetrate our hearts. And so I just want to talk about two ways this offends us. Uh, the first one has to do with the word light. Okay, so uh, liberal people on the left in, in kind of like the woke culture that we live in today have a problem with the fact that Jesus said, I am the light. I am the only light there is. So in other words, Jesus is saying, there, there's not your truth and my truth. Y you know, love is love, however you want to define love. No, Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm the light. It's just me. I am Martin Luther King, his word for it. I am the moral divine law of the universe. If you, if all you have is science, if all you have is your truth, moral relativism, that your world is very dark. There, there's no ultimate meaning. There's, there's no real hope. And, and so what ends up happening is, is if there's no moral divine law, no standard by which everything else is measured up to, then what you end up doing is you end up believing half-truths, half-truths about your world, half-truths about your life. What, what do I mean by a half-truth? An example of a half-truth would be uh, God loves me and wants me to be happy. That's true, right? I, I can literally go to verses in the Bible and I can make that case that that's true. God does love me and he does want me to be happy. But then what we do is we say, therefore, just do whatever makes you happy. Right? If God loves me and he wants me to be happy, then just do whatever makes you happy. And it couldn't be wrong if it makes me happy and God loves me and wants me to be happy. That's a lie. Some things are wrong. Some things are sin. Not because that's my opinion, not because that's somebody else's opinion. 
It's because that's what Jesus said. It's what Jesus affirmed. He, he is the light of the world. He's the only light there is. He's the moral divine law of the universe. That's offensive. But, but on the other hand, he also says, I, I'm not just the light. I'm the only light there is, but I'm also the light for the entire world. Conservative people, right-leaning people uh, also are offended by the fact that he said, I'm the light for the world. Don't worry, I'm coming all the way back around for you. <laughs> he, he didn't say, I'm the light of Israel. He didn't say, I'm the light of America. He said, I'm the light for the entire world, everybody. If your corner of the human race is all you've got, your world is very dark. Jesus wasn't interested in that. He, he literally comes and he says, I am the light for the whole world. That means white people. That means black people. It means Hispanic people. It means Asian people. I, I, I'm the light uh, for the whole world. That means older generation. That also means the younger generation. It, it means Americans who were born in this country. It means uh, illegal immigrants to this country. It means Wesleyans, Pentecostals, Baptists, <laughs> reform people, Arminian uh, theological thinking people. I am the light for the entire world. There's no one group of people who really gets to make an exclusive claim on Jesus because of what he claimed about himself. In fact, if you want to go even one step further into the offensiveness of the statement, what Jesus says here, I'm the light of the world, the word world there is the Greek word cosmos, spelled K-O-S-M-O-S, -S, and literally it does mean every single human being, every single person in the entire world, but it also means the, the created world. Jesus is literally saying the cosmos, everything in this universe was created by me and through me. And I, Colossians 1 talks about Jesus is the one who holds it all together. It was all created for him and by him, and it exists for his glory. So, so in a sense, like we should even care about the created world, the environment. He says, I'm the light for the world. It's offensive, isn't it? Just, it's kind of offensive. Like you start to get a picture at a certain point, don't you? Oh, I understand why they killed this guy. It's offensive. But here's the thing. If you can get past the offense of this statement, I am the light, the only true light there is, but I'm the light for the entire world, not just you and your group of people, not just Israel, not just America. If you can get past the offensiveness of it, then what happens is there are two promises profound promises that Jesus makes, that when we take these two promises into our being, into our lives, go ahead, if you will, to that, that next, uh, this next, yeah, the two promises Jesus gives us. When we take these promises into our lives, into the core of our being, it can absolutely transform us. First promise is this. Jesus said, if you have me, you'll never walk in darkness. If you, if you have me, I'm the light of the world, you will never walk in darkness. Again, what, what do we associate darkness with? Despair, fear, death, hopelessness. Jesus is literally saying there's no darkness that can touch you. Now, of course, what he's talking about here is he, he's talking about salvation. This is the promise of salvation. Jesus says, I'm the only light that can come into your darkness and rescue you and save you. You, 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 you can't produce light on your own. And if you have me, you're never going to walk in darkness. There's a uh, is it, this a direct reference to a chapter in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. We, we oftentimes read that chapter in church during Christmas time. Isaiah 9 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. For those living in the land of shadow, a light has dawned. Jesus is saying, I'm that light. I'm the one that was talking about. I'm the fulfillment of that promise that God gave his people. I, I came so that people would never walk in darkness. Not only that, I mean, this is so incredibly profound. And we talked about the very beginning of the Bible, right? It begins with light. That's how you know, all of creation starts. But also it ends with light. If you go to the very, very end of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22 is describing our eternal home, the new heaven and the new earth that God's going to, going to bring through Christ and his resurrection. Now, what it says there in the new heaven and new earth, it says there will no longer be any sun or moon, which if you live in Michigan, you're like, yeah, I know, I know exactly what that feels like. That's it's like every day, it's just clouds. That's all there is. That's all we have. 
That's not what it's saying. It's saying what, at the end of time, in the new heaven and the new earth, there's not going to be a need for any sun. There's not going to be any need for any moon. Why? Because it says Jesus will be there and he will be the only light we need. Jesus will be the light, literally the only real light, the only true light that will ever be revealed at the end of time is going to be him. He says, I am the light of the world. If you have me, I don't care what comes into your life. I don't care what thing you're dealing with. You're never going to walk in darkness. You're never going to walk in darkness if you have me. Some of you, your world is dark right now. And there's some things that are too big for you that you're trying to carry, you're trying to manage on your own. He's the light of the world. If you have him, if, if you put your faith and your trust in the person of Jesus Christ, if you give him your life, you will never walk in darkness ever again. There's no darkness on this earth. There's no darkness that exists that can touch you. That's a good promise, wouldn't you say? Second thing Jesus promises is he says, when you have me, you'll reflect the light of life. Those who follow after me will never walk in darkness and they will have the light of life. Literally, when it says you'll have the light of life, it's the Greek word echo. Now, just like an echo isn't the source, it's not the, the thing that produces the sound, right? It's the reflection of it. That's what he's saying. When you have me, you will reflect the light of life. So again, human beings don't produce their own light. Only God can do that. We, we don't create our own light. We don't produce our own light. We think we do, but we don't. What, what is Jesus calling us to be? Go ahead to that picture if you would. This is what Jesus is calling us uh, to be. He's calling us to be like the moon. We understand this, don't we? Like the moon doesn't create any light of its own, does it? If you see the moon, the only way you see the moon at night is because it is reflecting the light of the sun. In fact, the moon only becomes visible when it's reflecting the light of the sun. Its beauty, the beauty of the moon is exposed only in as much as it is reflecting to what degree it's reflecting the light of the sun. That's what gives it its beauty. That's us. That's what the church is supposed to be. The church is supposed to be like the moon, like we, our beauty is exposed as the church as we reflect the true light, Jesus. One of the problems is we, we, <laughs> we reflect a whole lot of stuff. It's not always Jesus. I don't know about you. I, I'm tired of reflecting my own junk. I'm, I'm guilty of it. For years and years here at Frontline, uh, as, as your pastor, there's something I would do that I... I've hardly ever talked about, but like um, Sunday, for, for week after week, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, what I would do is I would finish up church here preaching on a Sunday. I would talk to whoever wanted to talk to me, pray with whoever wanted needed to be prayed with. And I would go, before I left to go home to my family, what I would do is I would go and find the drawer where the clipboard was, and I would find the clipboard. You know what the clipboard was? The clipboard, it's still, uh, people still use it. In fact, they're walking around right now, I think, with it. Uh, the clipboard is, you know, there are people who walk around and they, they count up how many people are here at church. And they go in the block in the kids ministry and they count up how many kids are in the block, how many people throughout the church. It's the attendance. And, and, they, and they make a record of how many people came on Sunday morning. So before I would go home to my family every Sunday for years and years, I did this. I would literally go, I would find the clipboard in the drawer, I would look and I would see how many people came to the church where I'm preaching. How many, came, how many people came this morning to the church to hear me give a sermon? And then what I would do is I would put the clipboard back in the drawer, whatever the number was, and then I would go home to be with my family. A few years into this, uh, my wife, Carrie, confronted me. It was a painful conversation. So on a Sunday afternoon, she had finally had enough, and she said, listen, Brian, I can tell what the numbers were at church based on the way you come home and treat me and the boys. You walk in that door, if the, I can immediately tell that if the numbers were good, because you're a great dad, you're a great husband, the boys want to be around you, but when you come home and the numbers weren't what you thought the numbers should have been, if enough people didn't come to the church, she said, I can tell immediately the numbers weren't what you wanted because the boys don't even want to be in the same room with you, and neither do I. She was right. I don't, I don't know about you, but do you have these things like this too? The numbers had become my light. 
The numbers had become the place where I was putting my identity. And so what was happening was I was placing all my value, all my identity. That had become the numbers were my light. The clipboard, what it said every Sunday was the true measurement of me and how good I was and how successful I was. And so what I was doing then is I was going home to my family, the most important people in my life. And all I was doing as I was reflecting back to them, my own inadequacies, my own insecurities, my own fears... And what I've learned is if I don't allow Jesus to transform my pain, I'm just going to transmit it to every single person around me. I'm just going to reflect it back to every single person around me. I'm sick of living that way. Are you? Are you sick of reflecting you, your own junk, on, to your family, on social media, on the people you work with? I got sick of that years ago. I don't check the numbers anymore. I just go home and I, let, I, I just say, God, you get praise for whatever you did. Whoever showed up, whoever watched online, you get praise for that. It's a much better way to live. But when you make him your light, he's worthy of it all. It's about him. And then what happens is when you do that, you begin to reflect something different. You begin to reflect him and his light. It's a much better way to live. Is that what you're doing right now? Are you experiencing that? Are you reflecting the true light of life? Jesus says, when you have me, you're never going to walk in darkness. There's no darkness that can touch you, not even death itself. And when you have me, when I'm the place that you're looking to for your light, you're going to reflect me to the rest of the world because I'm the light of the world. Those are these two incredible promises Jesus gives us. And then finally, two ways we can respond to Jesus' claim. And I'll tell you, I think this is the most important part of the entire message. Because up to, up to this point in the message, everything we've talked about is just information. It doesn't become transformation until we actually take it into our lives and we say, what am I going to do with that? How am I going to allow the claim Jesus made about himself to actually affect my life? And so two ways that we can respond to Jesus' claim today, and both of them have to do with surrender. Because here's what I would tell you, we don't bring our own effort to this claim that Jesus makes we bring our surrender. We don't bring our strength to the claim that Jesus made about himself. We bring our weakness. We, we bring our surrender and, and we offer ourselves. And so two things that we can surrender, two ways we can respond. They both have to do with surrender. The first one is surrender your darkness. Some of you, your world is very dark. Every, every one of us, I would say, we all wrestle with darkness beyond our control situations that are just too big for us. Some of you right now, you're in a situation that it's too big for you. Maybe it's cancer, a diagnosis. Maybe it's uh, generational sin that just keeps repeating itself in your family. Maybe it's an addiction that you can't get free from and you've tried and tried and tried again and again. Maybe, uh, maybe it's different ways in which you, you've tried to, to measure up and yet you just can't. I, I was in here praying. I don't say things like this very often. Last night I was in here praying and just preparing for this and I felt like God said, there's somebody who's going to be watching today, somebody, whether it be online or somebody here in the room who your world is so dark, you've been thinking about suicide. Literally, you've had suicidal ideations this whole week. You've been thinking about maybe you've had thoughts in your head like, I think it's just going to be better for everybody if I'm just not around anymore. It's a lie. Jesus said, when you have me, there's no dark, you will never walk in darkness again. You have to come to this place where you have, the, the message of Jesus is not try harder with your darkness. That's not the message of Christ. The message of Christ is you can't do it on your own. The default position of every human being is darkness. Darkness is what you got to look forward to forever unless you have me. I am the only light there is that can come into your darkness. You've got to surrender your darkness to him. You've got to give it to him. You've got to quit trying to, to carry that burden, quit trying to do that on your own. And here's the best part of that. When you do surrender your darkness to Jesus, what does light do? Jesus says, I'm the light. Light cancels darkness. Do you understand that? Light doesn't cancel people who have darkness. Light cancels darkness. So people who walk in darkness never walk in darkness again, but have the light of life. That's the hope of Jesus. Surrender your darkness. Let him cancel your darkness. He, he doesn't cancel people. 
who walk in darkness, he cancels the darkness so people can be freed. First John says, when you walk in the light, when I walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, there's forgiveness from sins and I'm cleansed and I have real life. That, that's what Jesus invites us into. That's what he promises us to give us. Surrender your darkness. That's the first way to respond. Second way that we can respond, and I'll just tell you, this is more mine right now. I would just say in general in my life lately, I would say this is more me. We also got to surrender our light. Maybe for you, there's not some pressing sin. There's not some pressing dark situation that's bigger than you that you're dealing with right now. Maybe for you, you're just kind of like, I can't figure out why my prayers just kind of seem to hit the ceiling and bounce back down. God seems distant. I can't seem to, to, in, to draw close to God. Could it be that what's happening is you've just created your own light? All of us. We have ways in which we try to live independently from God. We try to just create our own light, even though we know we can't do it. Maybe for you, it's work, your career. Work harder, get a bigger paycheck, advance up the, up the you know, corporate louder, and then I'll be somebody. Our light is the way we seek to try to, apart from God, establish ourselves, make ourselves a person. You know, maybe it's money. If I just get a certain amount in the bank account, if I, if I get to that point, then I'm going to be somebody. Maybe it's beauty to be desired by others, to look beautiful, to get a certain number of likes and comments online, to stand on the scale and have that scale say a certain number, then, then I'll be worth something. Maybe it's family. If I just marry the right person, we have 2.3 kids, you know, and this, my family looks like this and the box is supposed to look at, if I can just get my family to look right, then, then I'll be valuable. Then I'll have arrived. Then I'll be worth it. For me, it was the numbers. What's your light? At some point, we have to come to this point where we're willing to just surrender our own light, that, that even our good things, not just our bad things, not just the darkness, not just the hard things, but, but if, we, if you really want God to draw near into your life, if you really want him to permeate every part of your life and to live these promises that he invites us into, even your good things, you got to lay on the altar. Years ago, um, my, we went through a stage where uh, my boys loved to make campfires. Every single night, we, I remember there was like a summer where, especially my older two boys, when they were younger, every night they would say, Dad, can we, can we build a fire tonight? Anybody ever do that? You build campfires in your backyard uh, as, your fam as a family? Okay, we all live in the city, apparently not. All right, awesome. Um, I had, we had these little like fire pit. Uh, and and uh, every night, my son Andrew especially, he's like, Dad, can we build a fire tonight? And so we, we had a tree that had fallen in our yard. We chopped up all these logs and we'd gather up all the sticks in the yard, you know, and we'd, we'd build a fire. And they loved like roasting marshmallows, sitting around a fire, telling ghost stories. You know, that was like something they loved. My wife loved it too. She was like, yes, please take them outside. Make a fire, please. Don't bring them in until it's time to just put them straight to bed. And I remember, you know, after night after night, there was this one summer where, you know, you keep doing this night after night and eventually you kind of have picked up all the sticks in the yard, you know, there's nothing left. And I remember my son, Andrew, comes to me for like the, you know, 10th night in the row and he's like, Dad, can we make a fire tonight? And we still had all these large logs, but we had no like kindling. We had no tinder, not, no, the smaller stuff was all gone. And so I, I wanted to, and I just said, I, we can't. I can't make a fire with that. Sorry, buddy. And I'll never forget, he didn't say anything. He just went in the house. A few minutes later, he comes out of the house with his arms full of papers. And he's walking right up to me. And as he gets closer to me, I realize the papers he has in his arms are his drawings. Andrew loved to draw. He would spend hours every day like just drawing pictures. His pictures were up on the refrigerator in our house. He was so proud of, of these pictures he would draw. He'd show them to us. Look at this. Look what I drew. What he'd done is he'd gone in the house and he'd ripped off all those papers off the refrigerator. He'd gathered up every paper. He'd walked out with those in his arms. He'd come up to me and said, Dad, here you go. Now you've got something to start the fire with. And it moved me that that's how badly he wanted to be with me. That's how desperately he wanted to just spend time with me to sit around the fire and just be together as a family. He literally was saying like, take all my, my best stuff, all the work I've done. It, it, you can have it all, let it burn. If it means I get to be with you, do you get it? That's us 
with our heavenly father. That's us with God. What moves the heart of God, what draws him into our lives is when we say, you, you don't, I'll give you my darkness, I'll surrender that to you, but you can also surrender my light to you. My accomplishments, my good deeds, my resume, my money, everything that I would hold and say that, look, I, I'm worth something. I'm gonna lay it all on the altar. You can have it all. Let it burn if it means that I might have you. When we want God like that, that's when revival comes into our lives. That's when revival comes into our families. That's when God begins to move. He begins to stir. And that's when he begins to do things in our lives supernaturally that are greater than anything we could ever accomplish on our own power and our own purposes. I want that. Do you want that? You got to surrender your light. Go through all the stories in scripture. How many times do you see this? Jesus invites the disciples to follow him. And what do they do? They come, they pull their nets up on the shore. They're fishermen. They drop their nets and they walk away. Elijah finds Elisha. He's plowing with 12 oxen in the field. 12 oxen means you were rich. He had a career. The guy had a job. He had money. Elijah comes, throws his cloak around him. If you know that story in the Old Testament, he, he says, I think there's a calling on your life. You can come do what I'm doing. What does it say Elisha does? He, Elisha chops up the plow for the wood and then, you know, sacrifices the ox and he literally lights it all on fire. All is past and he walks away. So I want to enter into a time of prayer right now. I want to respond to the statement. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I'm the only real light there is that can come into your darkness. And when you have me, you'll never walk in darkness and you will have the light of life. So I wonder, as we, I literally just want to spend a moment here and just go into a time of prayer. Uh, just so I know who I'm praying for here. How many of you, if you raise your hand and be honest and say, man, today I, I need to surrender some darkness to Jesus. If that's you, raise your hand, keep them up for a minute. Yeah. So there's something too big for me. Something greater than I, I've been trying to shoulder it on my own. I've been trying to handle it on my own. Okay. Today we're going to surrender the darkness. The, the stuff that we struggle with. Okay, you can put your hands down. How many of you would say, you know what, for me, if I'm honest, I need to surrender my light. It's my pride. It's my ego. It's the things I would prop myself up with. What I'm reflecting back to everybody else around me is not G, the light of Jesus. It's my own junk. It's my own. That's you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So as we bow in prayer, uh, maybe, I don't know, something about the posture of this helps me. Just hold your hands open, palms up like this. It's a posture of surrender. Let's just go to him right now. Jesus, you see our needs. You see our lives. There's nothing in this room, nothing watching, well, those of us watching online, nothing that's hidden from you. Because you're the light. You're the light of the world. We just thank you, Jesus, that you don't cancel people who walk in darkness. You're the light that cancels darkness. And so for those of us, God, right now, we just confess our darkness. We surrender it to you. We surrender the ways that we've just tried in our own power. We surrender the ways in which we've been unwilling to bring things into the light, dark things in our lives. We've been unwilling to confess it, unwilling to bring it into the light, and unwilling to allow other people to have it. Jesus, we surrender it to you right now. You can have it. We can't do it on our own. Would you be the light that comes into our darkness? Would you be Lord and Savior over even that stuff? Just give him your darkness right now. Let him have it. And God, for those of us in this room, myself included, who we, we, we've always looked for some way to kind of have our own light, have our own abilities, have our own talents, and kind of prop ourselves up on those things. Jesus, we want you. We lay those things on the altar right now. Let them burn. We want you, that we might have you. Come and have your way, God, in our lives. Draw us deeper into you. We surrender it all because you're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. We join the saints and the elders around your throne that are forever proclaiming you're worthy of it all, Jesus. 
We give it all to you. We surrender it all back to you. And we ask you to do with it what only you can do. Come and have your way, God. We love you. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, 